So I am Yui Kao. Uh, I'll be giving an overview of the Cloud Foundry Runtime PMC. Uh, I am the Cloud Foundry Runtime PMC lead, and I'm also the director of product management at Pivotal. Um, so, so what is the application runtime PMC, newly named today? Um, the, the application runtime PMC uh, directs strategy, development, and quality control of the core components of Cloud Foundry. Um, all of the required components for Cloud Foundry certified paths are uh, pro produced by projects in this PMC. So of the seven uh, certified paths that were uh, mentioned in this morning's keynote, um, they're using the components produced by this runtime PMC. Uh, for more information about any of the projects, you can go to cloudfoundry.org slash projects. There's links to the Slack channel, um, the Pivotal Tracker projects that, that show the work that they're, they're working on, um, links to GitHub. Some of the projects also have included links to their documentation as well. Um, you can also subscribe to CF Dev. Uh, at list.cloudfoundry.org, and uh, there you'll also see uh, the biweekly PMC notes uh, to keep up to date with uh, what the, the individual project teams are working on. Um, so here's a terrible architecture diagram uh, of the runtime PMC. There's loose relations in, in the placement, but, but really it's quite difficult because there's 19 projects um, and they work uh, very closely together. Uh, the ones highlighted in blue here, uh, permissions, bit service, and HA proxy are incubating projects. Uh, new projects this year were the services API, uh, that CF permissions, and HA proxy Bosch release. Um, runtime themes of investment um, broadly, and I'm still shopping this around, so I would love feedback on this, uh, but uh, I think security and stability are kind of table stakes in terms of themes of investment. You need uh, to be able to uh, have a stable platform uh, scale out. Uh, and guarantee application workloads can continue running. Um, you need to do that in a secure way uh, so that uh, people uh, are, are able to run their workloads um, confidently in, in uh, complicated environments. And uh, developer happiness is, is my personal favorite theme of investment, um, or in, in encouraging um, developer productivity and allowing uh, developers to focus on, on business value. Um, so in these following uh, slides, we'll be talking about a lot of things that I hope fit mostly into these themes of investment. Um, application lifecycle, um, I think broadly fits into uh, developer happiness. Um, things around improving first push, that includes um, adding more support uh, for uh, commands into the CF CLI manifest, um, making that a first class citizen and making that first push um, better. Um, improving second push, that, that, that includes investments in rolling app updates, um, zero downtime updates. It, people are often confused when you go from first push to second push and there's a significant amount of downtime in between because of the amount of time it takes to stage an app um, and perhaps maybe that staging didn't go so well <laughs> and you might have to stage again with some new bits of code um, or you might have to maintain your own blue-green uh, scripts and so if the platform can own some of that complexity you can again focus on, um, on, on uh, providing application uh, uh, provide, providing business value. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, people caring about uh, native A-B testing so they can roll out um, a little bit of their next version um, uh, and, and see how that goes bef be, uh, while still running um, the, a majority of the previous version. Um, Canary deploys, uh, being able to uh, roll one out and then uh, of, of your new version and, and make sure that's healthy before going on with the rest. Um, smoke test, being able to run smoke tests in a coordinated fashion um, with, with while you're rolling out your, your updates. And these are all areas that I think we can improve in, in push. Um, 
app promotion is an, also an area that I think we're interested in. Um, so that, say, you're iterating very quickly in uh, your dev space, but then you want to promote it to another space um, where your uh, uh, product manager wants to do acceptance. And so how can you uh, more or less promote that same uh, artifact to the next space in a, in a nice way? Um, CF local uh, is being proposed in the extensions PMC, but it's also in this broad theme of um, how can you get faster feedback um, locally. All right. Um, improved operator experience. We have Bosch Bootloader. Um, that's uh, a CLI tool for um, as starting up um, for for configuring and paving um, an IaaS uh, quickly, uh, starting with a, a Bosch director and getting all of that configuration um, uh, very simply. And we currently have support for AWS and GCP. Um, Azure is in progress. Um, vSphere, uh, I think, is on the horizon as uh, Terraform uh, support for vSphere matures. Um, CF deployment, um, it's very close to uh, replacing CF release, and this um, allows for much simpler manifest generation, um, taking advantage of the Bosch 2.0 features, um, and also allowing you to have a much more composable experience um, with, with what you deploy. Um, Bosch Backup and Restore support. Um, so the Bosch Backup and Restore um, exists in the extensions PMC, but um, each of the components that have state um, within Cloud Foundry now have uh, support to um, hook into the Bosch Backup and Restore and uh, uh, go, perhaps go into read-only mode or um, gracefully stop itself so it can have a consistent state uh, across um, uh, with, within the, that single backup um, for when you restore that. Um, we're also investing in improving route consistency and, and availability so that in the face of um, uh, instability in, in the management plane, um, NATS, for example, um, we may not have to uh, completely prune the routes after two minutes. Um, and uh, still be able to guarantee that your apps um, will not be routed uh, to an incorrect container. Um, connecting services. We have uh, container to container networking. Um, it was GA'd earlier this year. You can now uh, securely connect um, an, an app uh, from one space to another space and um, not have to go out and around through the, through the Go router um, with, with this in place. Um, we have application instance identity credentials, which I think is a new, a, a new tool for us. And we're still kind of seeing how we can make use of that. Um, but I think uh, in Eric's demo earlier today, he, he showed how you could, um, how applications can use those credentials to authenticate with each other and uh, be very sure of um, who, uh, uh, who's communicating with what and not have having applications actually have to deal with provisioning of those credentials. Um, MTLS support through the Go router. So, so now if you want to have um, uh, uh, mutual TLS, you can have that client certificate forwarded through the header. Um, and if your applications are able to consume that, um, which is now supported in the Java build pack, um, you don't have to spin up a, a TCP router and figure out how, how to manage that port and whatnot. Um, you can just uh, trust in that header that's forwarded um, through the Go router. Uh, Operator managed multiple certificate support that's uh, also now supported in the Go router and HA proxy Bosch release. Um, so now you can have um, operator configured support for, for custom domains um, using S, uh, SNI. Um, things that are still in progress include uh, securing service instance credentials with CredHub um, so that uh, if you wanted to, you could opt into. 
service brokers that can store credentials into CredHub, and um, uh, and and applications are then able to uh, retrieve those credentials and not have those stored in in Cloud Controller, where a Cloud Controller admin who may only care about operating uh, Cloud Foundry uh, doesn't actually need access to all of those credentials, um, kind of reducing the blast radius. Um, also, uh, the services API team is working on service instance sharing across orgs and spaces. Um, it's been long requested, uh, the ability to share a particular service instance from one space to another space, and I think this is common with, with microservices patterns. Um, Platform-provided service discovery is another area of investment um, so that um, you can... Uh, uh, and, and I think that fits really well with the container to net container networking. Now that there's policy, how do you um, provide internal routes, um, in internally uh, provide discovery for those uh, those routes and commun communication paths? Um, Envoy and Istio are, are also a fairly hot topic um, nowadays, and how can we take advantage of Envoy and Istio in the Cloud Foundry community? Um, there's a lot of uh, capabilities that Envoy um, provides and uh, in terms of uh, weighted routing, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, and uh, Istio, we think, will help um, control and configure Envoys and perhaps be that bridging mechanism between... Uh, oh. <laughs> be that bridging mechanism between apps running on Cloud Foundry and apps running um, somewhere else, perhaps on the container service. Um, Investments to support uh, legacy or non-12 factor apps. There, there are a number of legacy apps that um, can't run on Cloud Foundry currently, but with support for multiple ports. Um, a lot of Java EE apps, for example, n need uh, multiple ports, but with just that simple extension, they could run on Cloud Foundry. Um, shared volumes. We, we also have support for, and there's additional drivers and brokers um, that are being developed. Uh, we started with an NFS v3 driver broker. Um, the EFS driver broker is being developed, and I think there's interest as well as in NFS and uh, a Samba and SIFS driver broker. Uh, build packs. Um, there's investment in uh, multi-build pack support, which um, allows for polyglot apps or potentially API gateways to be composed um, with your app, um, and less forking of build packs in general, um, so that if you need to provide uh, certificates or a particular agent um, or, or um, whatnot, you can actually include that in your own little specialty build pack and then compose that um, with a Java build pack or Python or, or whatever that may be um, and, and uh, have, have these be coordinated so that you don't have to fork the build packs um, and then merge back upstream all the time. Um, OCI build packs is, is an uh, area of experimentation um, where we're looking at could we um, have droplets and rootfs that are actually image layers? Um, would those be more portable? Um, uh, what, what benefits could we get from that? Um, one, one idea is if we're able to do that, um, perhaps the uh, rather large Windows rootfs um, could be an image layer. Um, or refer to uh, Azure's uh, layer out, out there because they, they provide the uh, canonical layer for, for Windows. Um, CF Linux, Linux FS3 will come at some point in time. Um, I think that there's a current question of should we, should we wait until um, 1804 comes out? Should we build one for 1604? Are there compel compelling reasons to um, 
uh, to do this sooner with 1604, um, and that's something you can talk with Stephen Levine about. Um, OpenSUSE, they're also uh, developing uh, a root FS um, for SUSE, and of course, build packs would then need to support um, compilation on top of uh, SUSE. All right, uh, Windows. Um, the, we now have HWC build pack and .NET Core build pack. And I'm really excited about the Windows 2016 containerization support um, that brings to the Windows world uh, support for CFSSH and volume services. And um, that SIFS Samba driver is actually very popular um, for, for users who are interested in Windows .NET workloads, um, being able to connect to uh, their SIFS Samba uh, file share um, natively on, um, that they have uh, uh, within their environment. Uh, user management. Um, this past year or so, we introduced uh, two new cloud controller scopes um, to, again, help reduce blast radius. Uh, cloud controller admin read-only, cloud controller .global auditor. Um, uh, they act very much like cloudcontroller.admin. Both of them uh, do not have write ability. The global auditor one um, acts just like the auditor role, but without having to add yourself to every single space, which is the experience that, that uh, was before if you wanted to give permissions to someone and not, uh, to be an auditor, but not have them see all the credentials um, that are in the system. Um, the CF permissions team is uh, working on user role to group mappings so such that um, it simplifies um, the user management process so that you can um, map a particular group to uh, particular permissions, uh, perhaps space developer in a particular space in a particular org. And by someone joining that group, they'll natively have permission, that particular permission. Um, and when they leave that group, um, that, that permission will be uh, removed. Um, that, I think that's their first phase of work. Um, the, the next thing they're hoping to tackle after that includes um, finer-grained authorization, the ability to um, uh, allow a cloud controller, for example, or potentially other components in the system to, um, to, to define finer-grained um, permissions in this context, like while still being able to the use uh, user role to group mappings. But say, uh, we often hear um, about uh, separation of duties, where someone has to have a, uh, um, only wants the ability to stop and start and scale an app, but for whatever reason, is not allowed to modify the app or delete the app. Um, and so uh, to satisfy compliance, um, how, how, uh, um, a custom role, um, I, uh, fine, fine grained authorization would support that. And then custom roles allows you to um, build up uh, meaningful names for that. Uh, vulnerability fixing. I think Cloud Foundry is really best in class here um, with how uh, quickly we, we are able to patch rootFS and stem cells and really our components even um, as, as things are reported. Um, we're, I'm sure you'll, you see those updates all the time on the security mailing list. Um, we have an amazing number of penetration tests from all of the, the, the wide ecosystem and users. Um, if you can imagine all the enterprise uh, com uh, companies and uh, providers, they are throwing um, all, all of their resources at UAA. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Uh, and and, and uh, the, the the projects in general, um, and providing that back in um, and uh, almost on a weekly basis, we're triaging those um, and and addressing those as quick as we can. Um, and individual teams are uh, keeping up to date with third party dependencies, and um, we're working on additional scanning tools on how to identify that better. Um, in in languages that maybe don't have great support for dependencies. Um, another area of investment was um, 
securing a communication paths. And one of the bigger ones was securing the communication path between Cloud Controller and Diego. Um, while Diego was being developed, uh, there were a number of bridge components that were developed. And between the bridge and Diego was secure, but between Cloud Controller and the bridge, it was completely insecure. Um, and so we did uh, quite a bit of refactoring to get to the state, um, as shown on the bottom there, where um, we actually eliminated some of those components and absorbed the functionality into Cloud Controller um, and, uh, and otherwise uh, introduced a, a mutual TLS between Cloud Controller and Diego. Um, I think you can find in the documentation now um, much better documentation about all of the communication paths, um, the ports, the protocols, and um, they're, they're, we've been st slowly stamping them out. There's still a couple, um, but uh, we've been making good progress against this. Uh, rootless Garden. Um, we have uh, currently experimental support. We're hoping to um, roll that out to the PWS environment um, soon to see how this goes. Um, assuming you have all uh, unprivileged containers, um, well, you'll be able to easily opt into this mode um, such that uh, your surface area of attack, should there be a container breakout, is, is much lower. And um, Cloud Foundry, um, the Garden team, uh, contributed greatly to this work, of providing PRs to make it happen. And we're the first um, to, in the wider OCI community to adopt it. Um, isolation segments, we've made, a, uh, we've made great progress with this. I'm seeing a lot of adoption in the community. Um, the number of use cases are wide and varying. Um, I, we're seeing um, people put uh, an isolation segment into their public DMZ um, so that the routers and, and the cells are in their public DMZ, and those are publicly accessible. Um, but everything else, they leave in their internal networks. Um, or otherwise, we're just seeing consolidation. Um, we have one customer who is going from 16 separate foundations down to four um, because of isolation segments. Uh, in the spirit of refactoring, um, we're removing console dependencies, um, uh, distributed service locks. We're looking to move or eliminate them. Uh, the ones that we were moving, we we're moving to uh, the database. The ones that, um, uh, or, or uh, through the locket service here, um, and otherwise eliminating some of the ones where. Uh, for whatever reason, we reached for um, console for that, even when the component didn't actually need distributed locking. Um, the, the other aspect of console, the other use case for it was for service discovery and health checks. And this is very much still in progress um, as Bosch DNS uh, develops. Um, but the idea is to leverage Bosch links for discovery, uh, for zone affinity, and for that health, uh, and, and Bosch DNS for, for healthiness. Um, and that hopefully re will remove our dependence on console um, in general. Uh, we've also, in Cloud Foundry, um, anyway, the application runtime, uh, we've removed our uh, etcd dependency entirely um, and replaced that with Postgres and MySQL support. I think that reduces a great deal of uh, operator burden as well, because many operators are very familiar with operating Postgres or MySQL, but uh, their familiarity with troubleshooting etcd much lower. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, we're seeing that the relational database is, is supporting us um, in the fashion that we need. Um, and Diego scaling benefited, uh, was one of the, the ones that proved out that etcd wasn't able at the time um, to scale to the workloads that we needed. And I, I still, this was over a year ago, but I still want to highlight that Diego and Cloud Foundry in general, as, as a whole integrated component, um, was able to scale. Um, it's not, we didn't just you know, start up 
100,000 containers and, uh, and, and with uh, what, what not. We, we actually ran as an integrated platform at this large scale. Um, and uh, from this graph, you can see like things crashing intentionally and things recovering. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think um, the, the, the degree of scale that we were able to achieve with the components that we have, um, I think that's great benefit to the community. And I, don't, I, th I still think that's unmatched by, by any of the other um, uh, things that are out there currently. Um, routing performance. Uh, the routing team invested um, in improving performance and they had, were able to achieve a 3x throughput um, of the Go router by doing a few things here. Um, my favorite there was update the dependencies. <laughs> Um, and here's the, the headroom plot of uh, before, which is that red line there, um, and the, that throughput, and the much nicer one, uh, the blue one there in the, in the after, um, a much better throughput request per second. Um, Logregator performance. Um, uh, Logregator invested greatly in becoming less lossy. Um, so you can see here, um, uh, these are our graphs from, uh, from kind of before and after s certain deploys. And uh, you can see, uh, I think PCF 110, I forget what, what the open source versions were for that. Um, but it c goes from 50% um, um, kind of really spiky, terrible, which is bad. <laughs> um, it gets a little bit better after that certain release, after a certain number of investments and improvements were made in the logger system. And uh, after CF260 was deployed, it's much better, much closer to 100%, a few spikes there. And I think even after this, we've continued to make improvements um, in, in logger gators uh, availability. Um, I, there's now uh, logger gator SLOs and scaling guidelines so that you'll uh, have a better idea of when and how to scale the different components of logger gator. Um, I think that's it for me. Um, questions? And join us. <laughs> Do you, do you want to repeat? Yeah. Uh, this is one question around isolation segment and um, preventing one compromised isolation segment from compromising the shared control plane um, so that uh, we can have um, true multi tenancy, uh, um, even though one isolation segment might be compromised. I think um, this is something that. that uh, we, we've thought about, um, it's not currently prioritized, but it's, it's something we're thinking about. Um, so I would appreciate additional feedback. But I believe uh, we've, we've thought about, could um, the things in the isolation segment, the Go router and uh, the Diego cells, for example, um, provide clear, um, uh, when, when they communicate back to the control plane, um, have in their identity, in their certificates, um, more clear uh, identifiers about what sorts of workloads they're allowed to ask about or get, right? So that um, when, say, a cell was compromised and it goes to talk to BBS, it was only able to get the workloads in the blue segment, for example. Um, so I think there are some ideas around here, but it's, it's not... Um, currently prioritized. But I think uh, if you're interested, uh, perhaps reach out, reaching out to, to Eric over there. Um. <laughs> OK, thank uh. you. Um, I think we can all agree that the, the security work that has been done is 
pretty good, absolutely. There is only one thing that is, <coughs> sorry, a little bit um, left out maybe in this picture, and that is actually um, vulnerability management for the applications themselves, right? Um, we already have a better story with build packs and what that means for applications. But I think there could be something to be done there that would improve that story for, for our users, right? Uh, is there anything planned for that? I think th there's nothing currently in plan, at least not in the near term. There, there are things being investigated. Um, I think there was an idea that, for example, you could consider um, in that multi-build pack um, thing, uh, perhaps you have a black, black duck uh, build pack mm -hmm. that inserts itself um, at a certain point during the staging process to scan the app. Um, that's kind of in, in the source, and is that the right place to insert it? Should it have been done in an earlier pipeline at the code? Um, the, there's a few different considerations there, but, but that was one idea. Sure, that, that's obviously uh, possible, as it is possible to do it like during the deployment pipeline, right? But the thing is that often, like, uh, application teams de deploy something and is free of vulnerabilities, right, at deploy time. That might not be the situation one week later, right? How to deal with that is, uh, was, was the, foc the main focus of, of my question, actually. How, I'm, I'm sorry. How, how, how to deal like, with like, incoming vulnerabilities, meaning when vulnerabilities are discovered after the application has been deployed. Uh, something that is part of the build pack can mm -hmm. warn you maybe during staging, right? Yes. Uh, oh, I see. Um, so we have, and, and this is something you, you might want to follow up with uh, Stephen Levine, um, perhaps at least on the build pack side of the house. Um, we have thought about, like, could we provide additional metadata um, on, uh, on the app, such that we could log what dependencies did it actually pull down, um, which build pack exactly did it, uh, did it stage with, and with that information, some about what specific dependencies did it pull down, and what build pack did it actually stage with, um, and some of that information you do get um, with the new V3 APIs when you go through the new staging process. Um, at least which build pack was used with it. Um, but, but I think there could be more metadata, and that's something that he's been looking at. And once you have more metadata, how to query that, to, that information out um, based on knowing, oh, uh, this dependency uh, has a vulnerability, let me scan through my system's metadata. All right, I think that's it. Thank you very much.